We'd love to hear what you think about Litigation Radio. Please go to LegalTalkNetwork.com slash litigation to fill out a quick survey to give us some feedback on the show. As a fellow litigator, I know you have strong opinions, so let us know what topics and guests are most important to you. Thanks so much for your help. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Litigation Radio. I'm your host, Dave Scriven Young. I'm a commercial and environmental litigator in the Chicago office of Bakar and Abramson, which is recognized as the largest law firm serving the construction industry with 150 lawyers and 11 offices around the U.S. On this show, we talk to the country's top litigators and judges to discover best practices in developing our careers, winning cases, getting more clients, and building a sustainable practice. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcasting app to make sure you're getting updated with future episodes. This podcast is brought to you by the litigation section of the American Bar Association. It's where I make my home in the ABA. The litigation section provides litigators of all practice areas the resources we need to be successful advocates for our clients. Learn more at ambar.org litigation. According to studies, the U.S. criminal justice system currently holds almost 2 million people, with most of those in local jails awaiting trial. But American prisons and jails can be dangerous. They can be understaffed and overpopulated. And because of inadequate supervision, people in our prisons and jails are exposed to violence, including sexual violence. To discuss what can be done, and about prisoners' rights generally, I'm happy to welcome Hernandez Stroud to the show. Hernandez is a counsel in the justice program of the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. An authority on prisons and jails, correctional oversight, and constitutional law, he researches the scope of the federal government's power to fashion structural and systemic reforms that prevent and remedy the failure of state and local criminal justice institutions in observing the rights of the incarcerated under the U.S. Constitution. He also drafts and spearheads federal criminal legal and policy reforms. He currently holds adjunct professorships at both Columbia University and the New York University School of Law, teaching graduate, law, and medical students. Hernandez, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave, for having me. Pleasure to be here. Well, let's talk about your background a little bit. Some things that I did not mention uh, from your bio is that you're a first-generation college graduate, obviously uh, going to law school from the uh, Washington and Lee University School of Law. Tell us a little bit about kind of your family background, what it was like being a first-generation college grad. Obviously, you may not have had anyone in your family go to law school. So what was that like? Thank you for that question. So you're absolutely right that I am a first-generation college graduate. So I not only didn't have anyone who in my family had gone to law school, but I didn't have anyone in my family who had gone to college. And that had several implications for me. I didn't really know what college would be like. I didn't know how to study for college. I, um, at the time, had no clue how high school had or hadn't prepared me for the rigors of college. And so figuring out college, um, how to study, how to deal with failures, um, how to balance my time, um, were all new enterprises for me. And so with the help of friends and some mentors, I learned through the process of trial and error how to really do a good job in college and how to study and how to balance my time. And, and um, so I was involved in the organizations um, like student government and um, the band. I, the trumpet had been from the time I was in fifth grade, a very important part of my life. And um, I mean, I remember when neighbors would complain about hearing the trumpet from their houses and, and it was because I was practicing. And, and that was the first thing in my life where I sort of really committed myself and learned that you can do something and through the process of repetition succeed eventually. And so that life lesson and those skills translated or I apply them in other contexts like academics. And so by the time I had arrived at college, I was a principal trumpet in our orchestra for all four years of college. Um, and that's, you know, as a non-music major, I majored in history. And more importantly, I applied those same lessons of approaching the trumpet to my academic studies. That's really interesting. So what tips might you have for kind of a first generation college student or law student who's, you know, going into something 
going to this school for the first time and not having any background at all in this? I, you know, I actually struggled in law school with legal writing. I think that I was a pretty good writer before law school. I, I had um, excelled in college and had um, just graduated prior to law school from the University of Pennsylvania with a master's degree in education policy. So, you know, I thought myself heading to law school, a pretty, pretty decent student, pretty, pretty good writer. But legal writing is so different from uh, other sorts of writing that you might do in other graduate settings. And I, um, for better or for worse, didn't have a, um, the, a, a great legal writing instructor my first year. And so understanding eventually how important writing was to succeeding in law school, I found uh, myself going to other professors to really learn legal writing. But I guess my advice would be not being afraid to ask for help. I, early on in college, was somewhat reluctant to admit to a professor that, you know, I I was struggling um, or that I didn't quite get something. But I found that through admitting that I didn't know something and, 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 um, you know, to that to that end, understanding that it was okay to ask for help. That was probably the biggest lesson that that I learned. And I think, relatedly, understanding that you can learn a lot from your peers. When I would see other people studying and and understanding and, and, and slowly understanding how it is that they were succeeding, you know, I would ask, well, how is it that you're studying? And so I would look at my own study skills or the lack thereof and try to mimic what they were doing. So I, you know, I looked at what other people who were succeeding were doing and started to deploy those same tactics in my own approach to college and, and in law school. And that you know, ultimately paid off. And I developed my own identity with my own tactics based on what had worked for me. And so, so it, you know, was a process from college to law school. It really was a process of trial and error to determine how best to succeed. Well, I love all that. And I also see that you worked as a full-time school teacher at a public all boys high school in West West Philadelphia for Teach for America, what was that like, and how do, how did that kind of frame uh, the way that you think, or, or some of the things that you do as a lawyer? Teaching high school was by far more than law school, more than any other job I've had, including clerking for two federal judges. Teaching high school students was the hardest thing that I think I have ever done. And the reason that it was the hardest thing I've ever done is because you don't have control over the sorts of students who come into your classroom who might have lots of things going on outside of school that affects their ability to learn inside the classroom. I had students who were taking care of siblings, were holding full-time jobs, who were themselves in many ways more adult than I was. At that time, I was 21, 22 years old and had just graduated college. And I went to college in Alabama. So I was in Philadelphia, as you mentioned, and, and that was very different for me. But it was the hardest thing I had done because I grew connected to the students. So when when I would see them struggling, but had known that they had wanted to succeed dramatically, it affected me in ways that I didn't anticipate. It saddened me. It bothered me that you could have a student who wanted to succeed like any other student at any other school in any other zip code, but because of policies and I thought um, laws outside their control, it ultimately meant that I couldn't do the sort of job that I wanted to do. And it, in fact, was the reason that I went to law school. And another reason that I am in the sort of work, the line of work that I am now focusing on prisons and jails is because I had a parent who at the time was struggling with drug addiction and had confided in me that not only that struggle, but on top of that, she had become pregnant. And so she was 
absolutely worried, you know, would the state take away her child if she sought prenatal care upon birth of the child? Could she be prosecuted criminally for drug use during pregnancy? A whole raft of uh, really unfortunate, troubling questions that, (laughs) frankly, as a 21, 22-year-old, I was well underqualified to give answers to. But, you know, ultimately, in the end, everything worked out with her and her baby. But those questions, that idea that, you know, someone could be prosecuted for drug use during pregnancy, I really wanted to study that. And so I looked at that issue in law school, and that was actually the basis of what I did after law school, which was a fellowship at Yale Law School where I, where I was researching and writing about the legal implications of drug use during pregnancy. Got it. All right. Well, let's focus our attention now on kind of on the the prison and jail uh, question. You know, I come at this topic from a civil litigator's perspective, which means I don't really have a lot of experience with prisons or jails, except for the fact that when I was a uh, summer associate at a large law firm, we did a tour at our local jail, Cook County Jail. And I knew from that moment, like walking into the jail, that I did not want to be a criminal attorney and never wanted to have to visit the jail again. So that's the perspective that I'm coming from. And I think probably a lot of our listeners are coming from that perspective as well. And so my question is, so you know, prison is supposed to be hard, right? It's supposed to be hard time. But at the same time, prisoners have and detainees have certain rights. And so give us a flavor of the type of rights that um, our inmates um, are supposed to have um, in prisons and jails. Absolutely. And before I answer that question, I do think it's important for listeners to know, first of all, the difference between a prison or jail. That is a a question that often arises in the context of opinions that people have about what ought to happen to incarcerated people or what rights ought they have. So a prison is a place for people who've been sentenced to over a year's uh, worth of incarceration. And by contrast, a jail is a place primarily for people who are awaiting trial, who've not yet been convicted. They've been charged with crimes, but are under our Constitution, presumptively innocent. Um, You know, in our constitutional scheme, assumes, presumes people innocent until proven guilty. So most people in jail have not been convicted of crimes and are simply too poor to afford bail. So to answer the other, to answer your actual question about the sort of rights that people behind bars have, So people behind bars do retain constitutional protections, and a lot of litigation around prisoners' rights stems from the Eighth Amendment's uh, prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. And that is something, the use of which began happening uh, around the 1960s, the 1970s. Courts began applying that legal principle to prison conditions. Not only that, the First Amendment is also a source of rights for people behind bars, uh, whether in terms of religious practice and um, the, the freedom to be able to practice religion. Before that, though, prisoners really had no rights. Uh, courts saw themselves not well suited to intervene into the inner workings of prisons and jails. And so for most of this country's history, the court's essentially had a sort of hands-off doctrine as it related to prisons and jails. Well, let's talk about uh, maybe a bad example, which is, I know you've done some work on Rikers Island in New York. What are some of the problems that they've had um, in terms of you know not allowing or not providing constitutional protections to their inmates? Rikers Island um, has for decades struggled to be a humane institution. Part of the problem, and I might say the primary problem, is the overcrowding. And back in the 1970s um, and even 60s, what you saw across the country was the enactment of 
tough on crime laws, um, mandatory minimums, which meant essentially that judges were robbed of discretion and necessarily had to impose a minimum amount of prison time for certain offenses. And so the effect of those laws um, was essentially the ushering in of the what a lot of scholars called mass incarceration. And so prisons and jails, including Rikers Island, uh, began to see many, many more people beyond what design capacity uh, permitted. And so as it is, as it was then, as it is today, Rikers was overcrowded. It's overcrowded today. And that has many implications, as you mentioned in your intro. So for example, the staffing. If you don't have enough staff to supervise as many people as you have behind bars, that problem uh, of understaffing or inadequate staffing can lead to violence. It can lead to suicide. It can lead to drug overdoses. Many deaths could be prevented if there were less people behind bars. And so the place that I work at, the Britain Center for Justice, did a study a few years ago that really tried to look at how many people are behind bars who pose no public safety risk to society. And what we found was that there are 40% of people who are behind U.S. bars that pose no public safety threat. And so there are a considerable number of people, in other words, who are behind bars who could be freely released who, without any impact on, um, on public safety. And so part of the problem is, as I mentioned, the number of people that you have behind bars. Uh, and that just has a number of ripple effects. So staffing, it affects the uh, ability of prisoners to receive adequate medical care. Doctors are stretched thin to the extent that there are enough doctors. So it just that the overcrowding, though, is is really the nub of the problem behind most correctional facilities in this country that are struggling to uh, function as humane, hu- humane institutions. There was also say that I thought was interesting that we're an article that said, you know, there's this obvious human rights component where you want to make sure that your inmates are safe, that their constitutional rights are protected, but also from a public safety aspect, this article was was saying that bad prison conditions actually make us less safe as, as in the public because essentially you're, I don't know, dehumanizing these folks and, and they're more apt to commit crimes after they're released as a result of these conditions. I thought that was pretty interesting. That is absolutely right. Unfortunately, researchers have this term called criminogenic, which means that people are more likely because they've been introduced into a prison or jail justice involvement to commit more crimes than they would have been otherwise. And so that's absolutely right that our inability to operate prisons in a safe and humane way really does mean that people are not being rehabilitated behind bars. You know, a lot of, one of the theories behind American punishment is the concept of rehabilitation. But with so much overcrowding, with the penal conditions that exist because of that overcrowding, it is very, very hard to rehabilitate people in a way that they won't come out worse off than when they went in. And I think compounding matters, we haven't really in this country thought or 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 um figured out rather how do we ensure that people who do go through um who that 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 are incarcerated that they don't return to prison or jail recidivism is the way that researchers call that phenomenon and it is a it is a troubling problem and it's something that if we could figure out we could really get a handle on our mass incarceration crisis 
and, and recidivism is, I, I, I'm sure, um, something that we've been kind of thinking about for a long time and, and have never been able to figure it out. The other thing is, why is it so difficult for jails and prisons to just get their act together? And I don't know, is the solution building more prisons and, and jails? I assume not. I mean, what is the issue with making sure that these places are a are, are safe place uh, for, the, for inmates? Sure. I think that that's a a very good question and question that a lot of people are really trying to, really struggling with. I think part of it has to do with just a very basic fact that prison jail administration are complex, uh, complicated tasks. I, I, there are a number of factors that go into uh, running a prison or jail. I think the funding, uh, for example, how much funding a prison or jail gets from its legislature has a direct effect on the quality of life behind bars. And not only the quality of life behind bars, but also the ability of prison administrators, jail operators, to run a place that's humane, that hopefully can even be rehabilitative. So there is a problem, I think, with the ability of correctional officials to run these humane spaces that is tied to politics, which may be outside um, their control. I think another strand here is the political will of a um, city or state. So, for example, if you have a union that represents correctional officers that affords generous leave, that has, that has fought to have generous sick leave for its employees, you know, that could be subject to abuse. And in fact, in New York City, that is one of the main problems, uh, at least why a lot of correctional officers don't show up to work. So New York employs about 8,000 corrections officers, but on any given day, there might be a thousand people. There are, in fact, a thousand people, roughly, who call in sick every single day. And there is absolutely nothing that a correctional operator can do to stop that. And it's because of the sorts of policies that have been agreed to by the city, negotiated in concert with the correction union, that permit this policy to, to thrive. Suffice it to say, it's a very complex thing to run a prison or jail. There are some factors that might be outside of the ability of a correctional leader. And there are also things that politically might be complicated that deal with or that interface with the operation of a prison or jail. Well, that's really interesting. I know that you've written extensively on one possible solution to this problem, which is a possible receivership for a jail and why you know Rikers Island specifically might be a candidate for a receivership. And, and this seems to be a solution that could come into play where this, the political situation has failed, where funding has failed, or as you said, maybe a union contract um, has led to certain failures. And so let, let's talk a little bit about what a receivership is and how that might apply um, to a jail specifically. So a receivership is a court device that strips the government of control of a public institution, like a prison, like a jail, and substitutes political leaders with a neutral court-appointed expert at management. It's a stopgap. It's not meant to be permanent. It's designed to be temporary. The way I explain it to it uh, to people is think about you know someone at the scene of an accident who is bleeding profusely. And if you don't do something, that person might die before you get them. They might bleed out uh, before you get them to um, a hospital. So what in that situation might be called for is a tourniquet to stabilize the person, the situation, to stop the bleeding. And that's essentially what a receivership is, to temporarily stabilize egregious legal violation. And like I mentioned, the Supreme Court has noted that a receivership is not an in in itself. And so once a receivership brings a prison or jail back up to legal snuff, resolving the deficiency, the court 
will remove the receiver, who is a person that's appointed by the judge, and return control of the facility to the government. And so where does this come from? Receivership is far from new. It's Roots stretch back to the 16th century, back to England, to the reign of the first Queen Elizabeth. And it made its debut in American jurisprudence in the 19th century um, when judges imposed receivership uh, to preserve and protect real property and monetary assets and occasionally to reorganize corporations. Yet, In the 1960s, courts repurposed the procedure in an unprecedented way to combat legally segregated public schooling. Um, Everybody probably has heard of Brown against Board of Education, a 1954 decision ruling unconstitutional the segregation of school children by race. While that decision was momentous, its initial impact on segregation, not so much. Before the ink in Brown had a chance to dry, um, school legis- or excuse me, legislatures, uh, primarily in the South, showered the ruling with scorn, vowing to um, resist forced integration by any lawful me- uh, means. And by and large, the segregationists succeeded. A decade after Brown produced hardly any integration, more than 98% of Southern black school district or school children remained co-signed to legally segregated substandard schools. And so with that spectacular defiance and on top of congressional action, practically ratifying Brown, many federal district courts began building their hopes on receiverships to enforce desegregation decrees, drawing upon their broad equity powers. And so that use of receivership spread over time to other contexts implicating civil rights like mental health institutions, child protection services, public housing, and prisons and jails. And so what what is the funding for a funding mechanism for a receivership? I mean, it's, you know, presumably these the jails and prisons are getting funding from the state legislature and, you know, they're they're capping you know, the, the funding available, and that can lead to, you know, issues um, at those facilities. What, what, is the funding mechanism for receivership any different? No. Uh, it, I mean, I guess in a sense it is. Um, so the receiver will, and this is one of the benefits, I think, of receivership, is that it the receiver will look at essentially a, a, a question. What will it take Setting aside politics, which is important here, setting aside politics, what will it take to make this a constitutionally adequate place? And then the receiver will draw up a budget based on on that plan, and the receiver will submit that budget to the state legislature. And what's different is you have the, the, the judiciary involved. And so Essentially, the receiver will work with the legislature clad with the powers of the court to work out a budget for the reforms that are court ordered. And so one of the benefits of receivership is that a receiver operates, in theory, above the political fray. But I guess one of the drawbacks is, or one of the realities rather, is they must still work within government structures. And so, you know, If a legislature, for example, uh, refuses to appoint a receiver's proposed budget, that snub could theoretically stymie the intervention and place the court in an uncomfortable, sticky posture. So uh, there aren't a lot of instances where that has happened. There, There have certainly been disagreements, but eventually the receiver does has, uh, at least in the cases that I've studied, has been able to get a budget and 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 proceed with their their plan. Got it. And, and there are instances where jails or prisons have gone into receivership and presumably have come out on the other side, um, having some solutions to the problems that that were there. That's right. So since around the time of Brown, since the 1970s, actually, federal and state judges actually have placed prisons and jails into receiverships about 
only about nine times in um, s- since that time. So the first one was in Alabama in 1979. A legendary federal district judge, Frank M. Johnson, ordered the nation's first correctional receivership for Alabama's entire prison system. And that system, you know, it did, or, or excuse me, that receivership didn't fix every single problem, every single ill that had afflicted the system. Uh, and one way to, to know that is to look at the current status of the Alabama prison system, which just a few years ago um, was sued by the Department of Justice under President Trump for deplorable conditions behind bars. And so one of the cautions that I often tell people in explaining receivership, because I try to do this in an objective way, is that it can remediate problems, but it won't cure every ill. But I'll also remind people that it's not functioned, or excuse me, it's not designed to be a cure-all. It's not a magic wand. What it's designed to do, again, at the risk of repetition, is to stop egregious legal violation. And so you've had these receiverships that have happened in Alabama, that have happened in Michigan and and West Virginia and Georgia. And there's a current one in California. Um, There's a new one, actually, that is supposed to take effect in January in Mississippi. Judge Carlton Reeves ordered a receiver for the Hines County Jail, which is located near Jackson. So you've had these receiverships happen, and the hope is that you just put an end to the really, really bad things that are happening. And hopefully the state or the city uh, or the county in cases of jails will be able to benefit from the receiver's efforts. And once it gets the keys back to its institutions, operate a, a, a place that's constitutionally adequate. Well, we'll be looking uh, forward to hearing more about uh, those possible receiverships, and and we're coming uh, to the end of our time. So one final question, wanted to get your final thoughts on, you know, uh, prisoners' rights litigation generally, if law students or young attorneys were interested in getting involved in this sort of work, where would you advise them to start looking? I think my first piece of advice would be what you did as a summer associate, which is to visit a prison or jail just to see, just to see how challenging life can be behind bars. I think beyond that, there are multiple opportunities um, to get involved in litigation in prisoners' rights. I think people at Large defense firms um, take on matters pro bono. Of course, plaintiffs' rights firms are engaged in this line of work. And uh, you can also get involved from the perspective that I am, which is a more academic, more uh, policy-oriented focus. So working at a think tank, working, you know, uh, on research, perhaps for an institution or or an institute that that researches prisoners' rights could be uh, an avenue also. Perfect. Well, Hernandez Stroud, thank you so much uh, for being on the show today and giving us uh, your perspective on uh, possible receiverships um, to help out uh, these inmates who are struggling. Really do appreciate your time today. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you, Dave. And now it's time for our quick tip from the ABA Litigation Section's Mental Health and Wellness Task Force. And I'd like to welcome back Haley Maple to the show. Haley is a shareholder at Katz, Siegel & Maple in Tampa Bay, Florida, where she focuses on representing design professionals, general contractors, subcontractors, and manufacturers in all stages of litigation and in professional liability matters, commercial litigation, contract disputes, and construction defect litigation. Welcome back to the show, Haley. Thanks, Dave. Well, I understand you're going to be talking about and giving us some sleep tips today. So what's your quick tip? Yes, I am. Thanks for having me here. As you mentioned, I'm here from the Mental Health and Wellness Task Force to discuss a topic that's been on my perpetual list of things to work on, and that is good sleep hygiene. As someone who was actually kicked out of preschool for reading instead of taking naps many decades ago, sleep is an issue that still troubles me now, but I am working on hard like many other attorneys. My doctors, studies, literature, and medical research all tell me what all of us seem to know, and that is sleep is vital to both physical and mental health. Studies include those from Northwestern Mayo Clinic, and even a bunch of resources, believe it or not, from the CDC, which you can find on their website. 
Focusing on the mental health piece of good sleep hygiene, it's true that bad sleep causes more than mere grumpiness. Lack of proper sleep and lack of enough sleep increases anxiety and depression, decreases attention spans and the ability to cope with even minor stressors and results in brain fog and difficulty with emotional processing. This information is found throughout literature, including the ones that I mentioned earlier today and my own experiences with my own doctors. What's worse, poor sleep hygiene can result in a perpetual loop that many of us know too well. We're stressed and we're tired, but we can't sleep because we're stressed. Then we stress about not being able to sleep, which results in being sleep deprived and the cycle continues. But we're here to talk about creating new habits and breaking that cycle. Sleep hygiene is the methods that we use in order to create good sleep habits to help us. There are many tools and good habits to form. Most importantly, medical professionals and literature discuss the importance of developing a bedtime routine that includes time away from screens and generally a budgeted amount of time for slowing down. For me, that's about 30 minutes. That routine will signal to your body it's time for bed and can include various strategies like light yoga or stretching, a hot bath, dimming your lights, or a cup of hot decaf tea. Having a set wake-up time will help develop a nighttime routine because your body gets used to being on this schedule. Luckily, many resources from books to accredited yoga teachers online can help you develop great bedtime stretching and light yoga routines that anyone can do, even in the comfort of your own bed. Additionally, make sure and don't suffer too long. If you've been laying in bed and cannot turn off your mind after about 20 minutes, then get up, walk to another room, go, try again with some light stretching, read, or simply calmly sit in a dark room before going back and trying again. For me, writing a list of things that are running through my head helps me fall asleep if I am struggling because then I don't stress that I'm going to forget about all these things. I actually keep a little notebook by my bed so that a small worry like did I send a particular email, doesn't get stuck in my head on a loop, keeping me from getting the sleep that I know that I need. As a kid, my mom taught me to lay back and envision each thing that was worrying me floating away in a bubble into the sky. My dad taught me that while lying in bed, I should think about each part of my body, starting from the tips of my toes, and tell myself to relax. This would sound in my head like saying things, feet relax, ankles relax, shins relax, and so on, moving up my body. And I would feel the tension in my muscles just calm down. Now I know that I was actually learning how to meditate from my parents many decades ago before meditation was all the rage, but it really does help. And it's a very powerful sleep hygiene tool. You can find information about all of these things and all of these tools in various resources online, including the National Healthy Sleep Awareness Project, the American Sleep Association. And if you're concerned that you actually have a sleep disorder, you should definitely talk to your doctor who can conduct studies to see if you have something that should be uh, discussed further with medical professionals. And of course, always feel confident and comfortable talking to trusted mental health professionals about anything that concerns you, including sleep. That's all I've got for you today, Dave. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Haley. Really appreciate the tips and uh, really thought it was interesting, uh, your tip on the meditation piece of it, because I think uh, it's really going to help us uh, relax at night. So thanks a lot for being here today. Thanks for having me. Well, that's all we have for our show today, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about today's episode. If you have comments or a question you'd like for me to answer on an upcoming show, you can email me at dscrivenyoung, without the hyphen, at gmail.com, and connect with me on social. I'm at Attorney DSY on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also connect with the ABA litigation section on those platforms as well. But as much as I'd like to connect with you online, nothing beats meeting in person at one of our litigation section events. Please make plans to join us at the Corporate Council CLE Seminar in Orlando. 
Orlando, Florida, February 16th through the 18th. This seminar brings together in-house and outside counsel to learn, network, and share expertise about the unique challenges they face in representing corporations of all types. It's designed by and for general counsel and their outside law firms. So to find out more and for registration information, please go to ambart.org slash corporate counsel. If you like the show, please help spread the word by sharing a link to this episode with a friend or through a post on social, invite others to join the show and community. And if you want to leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, it's incredibly helpful. Even a quick rating at Spotify Podcasts is super helpful as well. And finally, I just want to quickly thank some folks who make this show possible. Thanks to Michelle Oberts, who's on staff with the litigation section for her help, as well as our fabulous producer, Rich Rivera. Thank you, Rich, for all of your hard work. Thanks also goes out to my fellow co-chairs of the litigation section's audio content committee, Josh Jones and Tyler True. Thank you to the audio professionals from Legal Talk Network. And last but not least, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.